Okay, so I'm very happy to come and talk to you folks about what we do at the licensing office and, and, and more specifically, how we try to help you do what you're doing as researchers and inventors. <clears throat> and so this talk is about invention <clears throat> and what you do with inventions. And so the first thing you do with an invention is to try to figure out if you actually have an invention. And that's not uh, an obvious, uh, that's not a question with an obvious answer. So uh, that's something we're going to talk about. And what do you do after you have, you think you have an invention? So um, the first step is protecting your invention. And it may be an MIT invention, or it may be your invention. And I'll talk about that aspect of what are MIT inventions and what are your inventions. And then we'll talk about licensing, what the, pro the transfer of the right to commercialize the invention from whoever invented it to whichever entity is going to commercialize it, which could be a company that's formed by the inventor but is a separate entity. And a lot of the comments apply to any kind of licensing, but there's some specific aspects about licensing to startup companies, in particular startup companies that are created by the inventors at MIT and then spin out of MIT, which is something we love to do. So I'll talk about that aspect as well. I work in the technology licensing office. I handle the energy portfolio for MIT, but we have sort of fluid uh, organization assignments we're really a service organization for the MIT community. And one of the themes of, that I want to leave you, you with is that we are at your disposal to come and talk to us about things. Uh, every situation is different, and we're, we're a resource to the community. And I'll talk a little bit more about that aspect as well. I think we have until 2.30. What I'd like to do is to present information until about 2 o'clock, and you can interrupt me and ask a question anytime. As a matter of fact, I'd like you to ask questions as they come up. OK? So we're going to dive into this. And there are a lot of aspects of inventions. And every one of these floating words that's coming up, we could talk about for hours. Every one of these topics is a complicated topic. So, and they're all important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, an overview. And some of you are very knowledgeable in some of these. Um, some of you may not be knowledgeable in any of these topics. But I'm going to give you an overview of the key aspects to know about, just so that you're aware. But also be aware that every one of these activities involves the help of professionals who are specialists in all of these areas and who uh, you can call upon to help you with these issues. I also would like to leave you, as a matter of fact, if you only remember one thing <clears throat> from this talk, it will have been worth, I hope it'll been worth your while, even if you don't remember anything else. And the one rule is, if you are in doubt about whether you should come and talk to us about any of these topics, then you should come and talk to us. Okay, there's never, it's never too early to come and talk to the licensing office that's part of our job, <clears throat> is to talk to you about what you're working on, understand what are the ramifications, point out some of the issues you should be concerned about, uh, and help you through the process. So come and talk to us sooner rather than later. There can be a lot of problems that are hard to fix if you come and talk to us later. But there's no cost to coming to talk to us earlier, because that's our job. And we have coffee, and we have tea. And if you come on Wednesday, we got donuts, too. So, um, so uh, but uh, all the levity a a apart, this is very important. And uh, I do want you to remember this rule number one. So um, we are going to dive into the meat of the uh, subject, and as I said, I'm going to talk about all those topics that were on the previous page, and I'm going to try to sort of focus on the highlights, and I'm just trying to give you a sense of the issues 
Um, but you don't have to remember any of this stuff because if you come and talk to us about your situation, we remember all this stuff. It's part of our job to remember all these things and to think of the things that, because you're not familiar with them, you may not be thinking about. So first, what is a patentable invention? There are rules that are part of the law around patent law, but they're not black and white. And there's a lot of, many attorneys earn a very good living arguing the definitions of inventions and whether something is an invention or is not an invention or should have gotten a patent granted or shouldn't have gotten a patent granted. So there's a lot of arguing about this and patents being reversed. But the basic idea is that an invention is either a composition of matter that doesn't exist in nature or an apparatus, which you can think of as a machine. And by the way, that apparatus can be implemented in a piece of software, but it's a, but it's a conceptually a machine that does something or a method to do something. One of those three. And that meets three criteria. <clears throat> Excuse me. It has to be novel, which means basically you can't find any reference to it that's publicly available. It has to be useful, and useful means you have, in order to get a patent, you have to describe to somebody how they can make your invention work. It has to be feasible. That's what they mean by useful. You've got to be able to actually turn it, turn it into the solution to the problem that, that your patent's about. And it has to be non-obvious. And the term here is non-obvious to one skilled in the art. That means basically, an intellectual peer of yours who doesn't know about your particular invention but has you know, uh, a, uh, a professional level of knowledge in your field. That when you describe your invention to that person, the key words you want them to, you, the words you don't want to hear them say is, oh, that's obvious. Okay, so these are the criteria. <clears throat> now, I want to say a comment about usefulness. Usefulness does not mean that this solves an important problem, that the solution is cost effective, that anybody might want to buy it. Okay, there is no judgment on the commercial value of the invention by the patent office in awarding patents. And that's why the majority of patents just sit there. Okay, they are paid for and nobody commercializes them, which is an important point to remember. So I'm going to keep on moving, but I now just want to remind you, I am going pretty quickly, but I do encourage you to put your hand up and stop me if I say something you're not, you don't understand, or if you have a question about what we're, we're covering. Okay, so please uh, feel free to do that. Okay, so that's my one slide on getting patents. Next question is, who is an inventor? The answer to this question, to understand the answer to this question, you need to understand what is in a patent. And one way to describe it is a patent has three sections. The first section is you describe what problem you're solving. The second section is you describe how other people have solved it in the past. And then the third section is you describe what is your approach and what aspects of your approach meet those three criteria that were on the previous slide. That third section is called the claims of the patent. The inventors are the individuals who've made contributions to the claims of the patent. And it's to the issued claims of the patent. You can file a patent that's got 50 claims and then the patent examiner rejects most of those claims. You argue as a patent examiner. By the time the patent issues, you've got 10 claims left. Well, guess what? The inventors of the patent are the individuals who contributed to those 10 claims, not to the 40 claims that were thrown out by the patent office. So inventors do not include cheerleaders, people who are making everybody, you know, who 
crunch the numbers. As all of you know, research takes a huge amount of work. But the law says the, the inventors are the contributors to the issued claims of the patent. Now, you may wonder, this, this might sound like a lot of sort of what's the point that Chris is making here. This is a legal criterion of inventorship. Okay? All of you are um, familiar with writing scientific papers and addressing a somewhat similar related question, which is who should be the authors of this paper because so many people worked on it. That's a subjective decision that's up to the authors. But in patents, it's not up to the authors. It's up actually to the patent office to determine based on the good faith information that's provided by the inventors. A patent can issue, and years after it issues, it can be overturned by, for example, by a competitor because the inventorship was not correct. So this is an important issue. And it comes up a lot. This is a subjective. We, we, we frequently work with research groups to figure out who the inventors are. And it's sort of an, it's a mechanistic thing and our patent attorneys all know how to apply those criteria. But I want you to be aware of this aspect. And so this is another reason to come and talk to us early. If you're involved in a research project that's got sort of fuzzy edges around it, you know, there's a, some core people working on it, there's people working on the periphery, there's other people who are making contributions, and you think it's going in that kind of direction, that's a good topic to come and talk to us about. And again, the earlier you talk to us about it, the better. Next topic. Remember that one of the criteria to get a patent is it has to be novel. And novelty means nobody knows about it, so you can't talk about it. Well, you can't invent something without talking about it. You can, but it, most of the stuff we do, most of inventions, you can't. So, in fact, you can talk about your invention and still meet the, no, the requirements of novelty. And these are the criteria to keep in mind. And if you can tick off these three boxes, in every interaction that you have with somebody before you file a patent, then you are meeting, you're still meeting the novelty requirements. You have to disclose it to specific people. So, if I had been talking about an invention to this group, I've already um, infringed on that requirement. However, if I'd put a table at the door that said, please log in, put your name and your email address. And, and I made sure everybody did it, good faith. I would meet that criterion. Okay, so specific individuals, not open groups, but you have, a, you have specific people and you have a record of the people you've disclosed it to. Even if it's a, a large group like this, you'll see from the other criteria that the bigger the group, the harder it is. But that's the first criterion. The second criterion is that the purpose of disclosing your invention in process is, and I put some of these terms you notice in brackets because these are legal terms, is to perfect the invention. Okay, let's say I'm working on something, I'm not sure which way it's going, the experiments are weird, I ask to present it to people at MIT who know the field, who can give me some feedback on what I'm doing, who can help me interpret my, my uh, experiment. They are helping me what's called perfect my invention. So my purpose is to perfect the invention. It's not to try to find people to buy it. It's not to try to find a magazine that's going to write an article about it. It's not for the purpose of finding investors to invest in it. It's for the purpose of perfecting the invention. If I meet that second criterion, I still haven't made a public disclosure. This third one is a bit trickier. And there's a lot of, there could be a lot of arguing, legal arguing about these agreements to keep it confidential. And there's been court cases <clears throat> about this. So what has satisfied courts when there have been claims of non-confidential disclosure? Obviously, if everybody signs a non-disclosure agreement, that's ironclad, but that's not realistic. However, if I'm going to present 
my invention to the group and I say, okay folks, I've got a list of everybody who's here and the reason I've asked you to come here is to give me some feedback on my invention so I under understand some of these issues and I'm planning to file a patent on it so I'd like you all to keep this meeting confidential and don't talk to other people about it. Is that okay with you? And everybody nods. Nobody says no and I make a note of it in my book. I don't have a written document for many of you but I make a note that I brought that up and people agreed orally. <coughs> We're okay. Okay, so you meet these three criteria and uh, your disclosures are not public. And since I noticed that some people are making notes here, I have a little secret agenda here. Here's the deal. I will send you a copy of all these slides afterwards if you send me an email and in the email you say something about this presentation that's very insightful. <clears throat> okay, that shows me that you were listening. Send me an email afterwards with a couple comments that are pretty insightful and I will send you a copy of these slides. That's a reasonable quid pro quo. Um, okay, so, um, yes, you want to go back to that? If you meet these criteria, you can say everything about it. But if you just tell up here what you're working on, what kind of problems and what you're, how you try to solve it, but right. you don't reveal specific details. Exactly right. Good. Good question, and I'll repeat the question because there's a microphone here, but obviously people can't come up here. So the question is, if I talk in generalities about what I'm working on without meeting all these criteria, let me, let me rephrase your question. How, how specific can I get in talking about it without having to meet all these criteria? Well, if it's going to end up in the claims, you have to meet these criteria. So if you're talking about the problem you're working on, that's fine. If you're talking about all the way other people have done it, that's fine. If you indicate which direction you're going, you're still okay. But remember, what's going to end up being the actual essence of the patent is what's in the claims, what's novel, what's non-obvious, and what's useful, what is actually a description of the way to solve it. So stay away from the non-obvious stuff. Stay away from the novel things that are key to, the, to your invention, and you're OK. OK? Is there another question on this? Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm just going to say that that uh, uh, potential way in which the person that you interact can claim authorship. Great question. Great question. So the question is if the interaction is about perfecting the invention, you're running the risk that the person who gives you feedback is going to really perfect your invention and is going to, is going to make a material contribution to the invention. So uh, it's a great question and this is something you have to decide on your own. How, m how much help are you going to ask for and the cost of that, the benefit of that help is you may end up with a much better invention and the cost of that is you may want, need to share it with somebody. And our general experience is that the really good inventions are good for everybody and the weaker inventions, it doesn't matter. So really the answer, what your question actually says more importantly is pick who you talk to. Um, be selective. But if you find people who can really help you, then you, you should talk to them. Yes, sir. Oh, interesting point. So this gentleman says that he, of the five patents that you have, uh, four of them uh, are as a result of these interactions. Yes. And you, uh, did the person who brought, is the person who brought this idea to you happy that that, that was the outcome? Oh, yes. I, I'm not surprised. That's usually the usual result. So uh, thank you for that good, good example. Just a simple question. Yes. 
comes to a legal action against the people who sort of take your idea and go do something with it, is, is that the... Why do we have to... Oh, that's a good, good, okay, that, that's great, good question. So the question is, do we have to follow these steps to protect the patent, or do we have to follow these steps so that if people take advantage of this, we can go after them? You have to follow these steps to protect your patent. Okay. Um, if somebody steals your idea, they have to demonstrate. First of all, you're talking about this because you're planning to file a patent at some point. They steal your idea and they go and file a patent before you. You can claim that they stole your idea. And the onus is on them to show that they were working on this before that interaction with you. You've got a record on a certain date of an interaction with them. And if you challenge their inventorship, they have to come up with some records that will satisfy a court that they were working on this before they interacted with you. So, the, so that's the onus on them. But it's another reason why I encourage you to talk to people about your invention, but following these rules and being very selective about who you talk to. Okay. What if you do this in one of the audience, you know, and people sitting there says, oh, I'm also working on this, you know. It's a complicated situation, but... What if you do this and somebody in the audience says, I'm already working on this? Yeah, and I kind of have a similar idea. And, and I have a similar idea? It, you know, it's <laughs> well, I think it's better that you find that out yeah. now yeah. rather than later, <laughs> okay? Uh, like on my very first slide. Earlier, any issue that comes up, the earlier it comes up, the better. The later it comes up, the worse it is. So, um, but you're being careful about who you're talking to about it. So, um, there was somebody else who had a question. Yes, sir. So, as far as I understand, there's some new patent law that came out last year, and now the criterion for whether two competing people get the patent or not is who files first. Yes, the question is, about recent patent legislation that changes the rules in the US. And one way to look at that is that we're aligned with other countries now. So that's the first thing, is that we're, we're more homogenized with the way it's done in other countries. And under the m current regulation, the first inventor to file will get a patent. But they have to demonstrate that they invented it. They have to show inventorship. And so if you have a record that they met with you on a certain date, and you have records of all the work you did before you met with them, and they can't produce any records of work they did before, you may, you know, you're gonna be able to go after them. So the, the first to file rule, which is the rule, does not relieve you of the requirement to demonstrate that you invented it independently. Yes, sir. One more data point. Yes. Uh, my first design, I, uh created a data sheet and I mailed it to myself, kept it sealed. And a few months later, a West Coast company cloned my design. Uh -huh. And they did a sloppy job of making their own data sheet. So I got one copyright. But that's always a good practice. If you've got a unique idea, you think, do the copyright practice of mailing yourself all your info and keep it sealed for when it might be needful. So the gentleman is saying there's a technique to, in, to ensure that you have a positive timestamp on what you've done, which is to mail something to yourself. If you work at MIT, there's a, that's an interesting technique. There's a much better way. Come and talk to us, okay? Because we will put a very official looking timestamp, uh, date stamp, and uh, file, we file stuff away forever. And we know exactly what records we need to keep on your behalf. Another reason to come and talk to us early, and we'll tell you what kind of information we want from you to make sure that, we're, that we have a, tr a time stamp track record of, of your work. Okay, so who owns the invention? Do you own the invention, or does MIT own the invention? Or does a third party who you're not even aware of own the invention? This is a policy issue, and so this first part is a summary of MIT's policy. Basically, 
the simplest way, I think, to look at it is that anything you invent while you are a grad student or a faculty member or a paid research scientist at MIT is owned by MIT, so you have to assign ownership to MIT, unless it's unrelated to your project. You have to meet all three of these criteria, by the way. It's unrelated to your project. Your invention did not use MIT funding, and you didn't use MIT facilities in developing the invention. And we don't include libraries and office PCs as MIT facilities. Otherwise, the invention, you, according to the invention assignment agreement that you signed when you either became a grad student or a scientist or a faculty member at MIT, if you don't meet those three criteria, you have to assign your invention to MIT. So here's another reason to come to talk to us. If you're working on something and you're not really sure if it's an MIT invention or if it's your own personal invention or if you're really certain it's your invention, it's you know, you're doing it in your basement, it's related to some other interest you have or some previous work you did and you think, you know, I'm, wor I'm working on something really cool but this is unrelated to MIT and MIT shouldn't own it. This is another reason to come and talk to us. Um, because we can help you figure that out. And we don't have a vested interest in trying to sweep up individuals' inventions um, into MIT. In addition to that, once you've disclosed it to us, you can request a waiver letter from MIT. So you have a piece of paper from MIT that says, MIT does not claim ownership of this invention. And that can become very useful to you. Five years later, you want to try to sell your invention to somebody or start a company around it, and the person who's going to buy it says, well, wait a second, how do I know it's yours? And you, know, you invented this while you were at MIT. So that's it about ownership. I know there's going to be some questions. So I'll take that question in a second. Um, but that's all I want to say about ownership. Um, but it's a topic that we can talk about a lot. And after, I'll take all your questions and then I will give you the seven tips you need to know to know everything there needs to be known about getting a good patent. So yes, what's your question? If uh, MIT won't own it, why should the TLO help us? If MIT won't own it, why should the TLO help us? Um, well, it's a good question. It's part of our job to help you was your inventions and, and it's in our interest to help you determine if it's an MIT invention or your invention. Um, and we consider it part of our job to help you with your own invention. So let me give you the next question that you could ask me, which is how much will MIT help me with my inventions? Because if the invention is assigned to MIT, we're going to do a lot of work on that invention. You know, we're going to pay for patents, we're going to try to find a licensee, I mean, we, we do a lot of work on MIT-owned inventions. But I'll extend your question. How, mu how much help can you expect from MIT if it's your invention? The first one is we'll make sure that if you need some documentation from us for later, that you have that, that you, that you have the records you need. We'll give you some advice on your invention, which you can take or not, whether we think it's valuable. You can ask us if we think it's patentable. Um, you can ask us for who's a good attorney to use. Uh, and whether you should file a patent. We'll give you advice. Um, and we can give you a fair amount of advice, but we won't go and file a patent for you. And we won't go and try to find a licensee for you. Does it, that answer your question? OK. All right, any other questions on assignment of ownership? Yes. Defining unrelated research, suppose you're working on a project, you, you do it in a certain yeah. way, and then you have an alternative way of doing the same yeah. thing. OK, define, define unrelated to your research. That's where the coffee, tea, and donuts come in, okay? Because, you, and it, some common sense. And generally, there's not a lot of disagreement about it. Sometimes it falls in a gray zone, but you sort of see it. You, but it's a great question. That's why you have to talk about it. And every situation is a bit different, so you talk about it. And, uh, but these issues come up a lot, and there's not usually a lot of problems with them. For example, we have spin-out companies that are doing work where researchers are consulting with the spin-out companies and it's in the same general field as the research in the lab. So this issue of how related it is, it tends to be, in practice, either very related or unrelated. 
you'd be surprised maybe, but there's not, a, in, in the real world, there's not a lot of gray zones, but there are sometimes ones. And then when there are, they are, <clears throat> what we do as the inventor is we suggest ways that they can more clearly differentiate their work on an ongoing basis, if it, if it does seem to be falling in the gray zone. How, they're using yes. research budget from MIT. Yes, so how common is it for, for example, faculty to have unrelated uh, inventions? Faculty have consulting privileges. Okay, they can go and consult for their own benefit with companies. Um, if they're going to consult in a field that is close to their research, they have to file a conflict of interest form with their department chair. But many faculty at MIT are active in consulting with companies. and. They are often inventors on patents that are owned by the company that they're consulting for. So I don't know the stats. I think that most of the MIT inventors, the vast majority of their patents, the prolific inventors are mostly MIT patents, but you know, MIT attracts pretty creative people. So there's a fair amount of individual invention going on. We don't keep track of it if it's not MIT, and so I'm sort of speculating. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's a fair amount of it. We like those kinds of people to come and work at MIT. So we don't want to discourage people from developing their own inventions. OK? Yes, sir? Uh, does TLO care um, how long you're at MIT? Because uh, as a postdoc, I might not be there next year. I'm smiling at that question because before, the question is, does MIT care how long you're at MIT? Does MIT care how long you are at MIT? And we were talking a little bit before about how postdocs work so hard and don't make a lot of money. And so uh, working for MIT, and so we're speculating about whether that's a policy designed to encourage them to leave or to stay. But um, no, we, as long as you are in MIT's employ, TLO doesn't care. Do you, is there, uh, I'm saying it's an interesting question. I've never had that question before. Is there an aspect of it? Well, if I'm not here next year, but I, I work with you, you know, over the summer on something, and, I'm, and then I'm gone, Oh. Okay, so the question is, if I work here and then over the summer I'm gone, I don't know if, you're, if what I'm thinking of is what you have in mind, but all we care about is what was the relationship when the, when the invention was made. That's what's legally important. We work with inventors who have been gone from MIT for years, okay, but what we're working with them on is things that they invented whilst they were here. Remember, some patents can take years and years to issue. And there's no statute of limitations on when you file your patent. You can invent something and keep it in that envelope for years before you file. So is that where you're headed? Yeah. More yeah. So we work as inventors for sometimes for years after they've left MIT. Okay. Or faculty will go to another university, for example. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Right, right, which happens a lot. Right. So okay. Yep. Happens a lot. So the question is, I'm in the middle of something here, and then I leave MIT, right? And I'm going to continue. I might, I might work in a different field after I leave. I might stop this work when I leave, or I might continue working exactly what I was doing. There's all kinds of scenarios. And there we have lots of inventions where some inventors started the work here and then continued it in another institution or vice versa. We really would encourage you to make a disclosure of the current state of your invention essentially on the day you leave. So you have a record and we have a record of where the work was, what stage it was at when you left MIT. Um, by the way, you can send that disclosure to us two months later or three months later, but it's here's where the re research was on the day I left MIT. Same thing, if you come to MIT from another institution and you've got all kinds of ideas and you were working on something, you may want the day you arrive at MIT to send us a disclosure and say, I want the TLO to see all this work that I did before I came to MIT. That can be useful to you as well. In, uh, in the opposite scenario, where you come to MIT, halfway through a project. What constitutes work, by the way? Like, work that you bring in, I mean, um, 
something related to, what, the question is what constitutes work? Does it have to have been done at the, at the conceptual level? Does that count? Like if I had the concept before but only did the physical work in the laboratory here? So what constitutes work? And the question was, for example, if I had the concept somewhere and then I did experimental work here. Now you're getting into more detail than we can really talk about today. The terms for it, by the way, are conception and reduction to practice in the patent language. And the invention requires a concept and a reduction to practice of the, of the invention. So if you conceived of it somewhere and you do the reduction to practice in another place, in general, the ownership will be split. But again, there, are, there could be exceptions to that. But that's a reason why when you're facing an important transition, and by the way, the advice that I'm giving you here does not, is not just for MIT. So for example, if you go and work for a company, um, the, the day you sign that IPIA was a company, if you've got stuff you've been working on, you should make a disclosure to the company of what you've been working on. So they understand what you're bringing with you that you had before you arrived, et cetera. When you leave a company, you should do a disclosure to them of where you were. So keep in mind that th this advice is, goes broader than just your relationship with MIT. You're probably going to work for lots of different institutions or companies during your career. <clears throat>